Um, good morning and welcome to the meeting. Um, and I want to start by wishing everybody a happy new year. Um, and we have a interesting year ahead of us. <laughs> and this board, um, as part of the bigger transportation equation and all of our partners um, in the field, I think really have an opportunity as we move into the new year to, as always, take a good look at how we best move forward. So I hope it finds everyone happy and healthy. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Delaney is not quite so healthy and will, is absent due to sickness just for the day and apologizes. He will catch up with me about um, the results of this meeting. And we are expecting Mr. Pixera um, sometime in the near future. Um, if it is um, all right with the board, I would like to suggest that we add an or move an agenda item out of order, and that is under old and unfinished business, um, to take a few moments to recognize um, a board member who spent six years, I think, ever with us, um, working <clears throat> in earnest with many of you to help advance the cause of the Public Transportation Safety Board and New York State DOT safety effort in the area of um, bus and rail safety. And we are fortunate that Deborah was able to take a few minutes away from her job here. Um, she will be receiving um, a letter from the commissioner thanking her for her service. But I also would commend to you a resolution that I would offer up for motion and acceptance. Um, Whereas Ms. Green has served as a member of the board from 2002 through 2008, and whereas Ms. Green's strong commitment to Public Transportation Safety Board and the rail and bus transit safety is acknowledged, and whereas Ms. Green has been dedicated to improving public safety in New York State, and whereas Ms. Green's knowledge and active participation in board proceedings strengthen the board's ability to recommend preventative actions that will make public transportation safer for the traveling public, and whereas Ms. Green's colleagues on the board and members of the staff wish to express appreciation for her commitment to the board and to public safety, now therefore be it resolved that the members of the Public Transportation Safety Board and staff recognize Ms. Deborah Green for her contributions and support of public transportation safety and wish her well in all future endeavors. The board further directs a copy of this resolution to be made part of the permanent records of the board and a copy sent to or handed to <laughs> Ms. Green. May I have a motion? Mr. Burke, seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any discussion? I missed that. I'm sorry. Deborah, would you come up front and join us for a moment? Um, I will welcome any comments from the board members who served with Ms. Green, and then I'll be glad to ask you to accept a small token of our appreciation. David? Yes. It was a pleasure working with you over these past few years, and I wish you success in your future endeavors. Thank you. Yeah. Obviously, the same for me. I'll miss my partner on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Those are probably the best no, parts right. of the meeting. You do more work. Than um, I know I'll speak for the staff, and many of them were very... Um, glad to be able to take a few minutes today to recognize your support of their efforts and your leadership on the board. Um, the token of our appreciation is a commendation of service presented to Deborah Green in honor of your dedication and service to the people of New York State to improve the safety of the traveling public through your six years as a board member of the New York State Public Transportation Safety Board. And I appreciate it if you accept this. Thank you, Karen. It's an honor to um, serve these past six years on the board. I really enjoyed working with my colleagues on the board and with the DOT leadership. And I want to um, especially thank the staff of the PTSD for your enormous responsiveness to all the concerns and um, questions that we've had over the years. And again, it's been a, a wonderful, gratifying experience. And I wish you all well in the next coming year. A safe and happy year. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. And here's your officially sent. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, with a highlight for today, we'll we'll move on to the agenda. Um, any other changes to the agenda from any of the board members? 
since I took the will or the roll of the chair to move one item forward. All right, then um, just to make sure everyone did get a slightly revised agenda, it should have been in your places. Um, just with one um, add under the accident cases and resolutions. Um, we have added item B, the FTA safety audit and resolution, and we'll be discussing that when it comes up in order on the agenda. First item um, is to seek concurrence on a forum. Uh, yes, there is one for both and the Thank you. Um, the next is approval of the previous meeting minutes under tab three in your books. In my book, tab. item three, the approval of the minutes from November 13th. I make a motion to accept the minutes. Mm -hmm. Second. Um, any corrections, comments, deletions? All in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, I have to do something that I haven't done. I'm forgetting I'm in a different place. <laughs> you do have to put a red but push the red button when you wish to speak. Um, and if you wish not to be heard, push that button and go back to green. And I forgot because I was excited about honoring Deborah to ask that we go around the room and introduce not only the board members, but of course um, the key staff that are here today. Um, I'll start with, let me start with you, Bill. Uh, Barry Kluger, MTA Inspector General. John Fabian, PTSB Bus Staff. Rob Morado, PTSB Rail Staff. Jerry Shook, PTSB Rail Staff. Dennis Fitzgerald, PTSB Board Member. David Burke, Board Member. I'm Don Baker, uh, designated executive director. Karen Ray, um, acting chair and deputy secretary for the um, Department of Transportation. Uh, Bob Ryback, counsel for the board. And then we'll go to the folks in the audience. Scott Weinstein, U.S. Secretary. Talk to your soul. Jay Longhorn Boss. Jim Bernard, Board Member. And I'm Gerardo Mendoza, New York State DLP. All right. Um, we'll move on now um, to the section of our agenda for accident cases and resolutions. Um, we'll start with rail accident cases, um, led by Mr. Shook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today we're presenting two abbreviated rail reports for your acceptance. The first case involved Metro North Railroad at a grade crossing accident at Green Lane in the town of Bedford. The accident occurred on the 29th of September and was caused by human error. What made this uh, accident unique was that it was the result of a motorist following the commands of a mobile GPS device which instructed him to make a right hand turn, which he did, but unfortunately he turned onto the railroad tracks and not onto nearby Route 17. Our investigation found no culpability on the part of the railroad. However, we do know that there have been several accidents at this crossing over the past few years, and because of that, many enhancements have been or are being planned to be uh, made at this location to improve safety. Some of those improvements include additional lighting, delineation of the pavement edges with reflectors, uh, overpainting the stop and lane striping for better visibility and the placement of additional warning signs and the, along with some enhancements to the railroad's uh, response procedures. There were no injuries associated with this accident. It was just a misfortune uh, due to human error. The second case on the agenda, abbreviated case, involves the side swiping of two Long Island trains in Jamaica on November the 19th, which was also due to human error. In this case, our investigation found that due to prior service interruptions, the involved two trains arrived at Jamaica on tracks other than those routinely used. Both trains arrived within minutes of each other and were to follow one another west towards Manhattan. As the one train left the station, the following train also pulled out, but 
without proper signal display to proceed beyond the converging switch at the interlocking just west of the station. By the time the engineer realized that he didn't have the route to proceed, he immediately placed the train into emergency but slid into the side of the passing train. The engineer on the uh, second train was cited for a violation of operating rules and received a 30-day suspension. And there were five minor injuries associated with this sideswipe. So with that description of the two cases that are on the agenda, if anyone has any questions on either one, I'd be happy to try to answer them at this time. If not, I would ask for a motion to accept both of those abbreviated reports. Yes. Um, just one comment that it has to do with um, Green Lane, actually. I have to remember the red button, too. Um, Green Lane incident, which is, although it was very much within our um, responsibility to go out and investigate the issue, um, working with partners who are not our traditional partners in the local municipalities to find ways that would help reduce the potential for future incidents um, was, in my mind, the very proactive type of um, activities that we are pleased to see our um, staff engage in. So I know this was, it actually got quite a bit of press that this was an issue and was it the GPS or what was it that caused this problem as a configuration and by going out and testing that and then working closely with the community, I think there's been a resolution that has significantly improved the safety of that particular intersection. So I want to applaud, again, the staff efforts above and beyond just citing it and making it known, but actually working on a corrective action plan with partners that are different than our normal partners in these endeavors. And with that, um, Jerry, any comments on that? Uh, no. Staff, thank you. Okay. I thank you for my staff. All right. Um, then we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor of approving the rail accident case reports? I'll make a motion aye. to accept. Signal by saying aye. Any opposed? Unanimous to carry. Okay. Also on today's agenda, uh, we have a resolution uh, package that was to accept the audit report and staff response to the FDA's audit of the PTSB State Safety Oversight Program. The audit was conducted uh, in late September and the final report contained one finding of compliance with a recommendation and 17 findings of noncompliance to the federal fixed guideway safety oversight law commonly referred to as 49 CFR Part 659. Uh, in the pre-board package you received a copy of the final report, our interim response, which we sent out immediately after receipt of the report, and a draft of our final response to the findings. Uh, the audit reviewed over 160 elements identified by Part 659, to which the 17 findings of noncompliance um, and one finding of recommendation were, were found. The, the findings covered seven general areas. Uh, program management and standard development had two findings. System safety program plan and security plan review and approval process had one finding. Oversight of internal safety and security reviews had five findings. Three-year safety reviews of the rail properties had two findings. Accident notification investigations and corrective action plans had six findings. There was one on hazard management and one on formal reporting to the FDA. Uh, your package details the corrective actions towards the satisfactory resolution of the findings and establishes a timeline for each of the corrective action plans which the staff is proposing. And your package also has a copy of the resolution which is entitled PTSB Resolution 1898 which has been prepared for your review and hopefully your acceptance. Uh, this time if anyone would like to before I open for comments, um, clearly um, this was a an audit that caused us significant concern. I have had meetings with the commissioner. Um, the biggest clear direction was that there was not adequate staff to carry out all of the multiple updates and responsibilities that continue to, to grow and along with the recognition that our accident investigation and everything was going very well. 
Um, I am pleased to announce the reason this wasn't to you in its completed form a little earlier is we've spent the last two weeks pressing for the additional two staff positions through the tough fiscal crisis. Those were okayed two days ago officially. They have already been posted to fill for two um, additional rail safety folks that will make um, that staff assures me and I will ask them to assure you as well gives them the resources necessary to fully comply and take this corrective action plan and meet the deadlines and dates. We have had some difficulty in hiring those folks in the past. We've had one posted before. Um, if that is the case, we are prepared to seek consultant support as part of our action plan or a combination of both depending, but the first action is to attempt to hire full-time DOT staff to be um, to supplement Jerry's team and take on the responsibility for much of the work that was defined in these non-compliant areas. Any questions from the board members? Uh, my only question, and I would believe that that's a statement that with the hiring of the staff that we believe that we can be in full compliance in terms of our responsibilities regarding uh, what was found during those audits. Yes. Or the use of consultants. Or there are any other issues that need to be discussed beyond the hiring of that staff or the use of consultants. Um, Mr. Shook, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, this entire corrective action plan, including the dates that are now included for compliance, are all predicated on the hiring of qualified personnel that were just posted. Is that a correct statement? That's correct. Yes. Okay. But if we have those staff, we will be able to accomplish this corrective action plan. We will be much better in a much better position to make an effort to comply with all the findings and bring them to a satisfactory resolution, yes. Um, as chair of the board, I am going to ask for a monthly update on the corrective action plan. I will bring to you any um, concerns that are in the way of meeting this corrective action plan for discussion and potential future action. Um, if the corrective action plan seems appropriate and valid, then I'd like to handle it that way with a monthly report and an update back to you if there is any deviation from the plan that's defined in front of you. That certainly sounds like the correct uh, course of action. The only other comment that I would have is that the system safety plans that we have been approving as a recommendation from the staff, a key element in there has to be the corrective action plans within their safety plans. When an incident occurs and a review and investigation takes place, the follow-up has to be to remedy that in a way that it gets corrected. Not just act towards responding to it or who's responsible for it, but actually developing some sort of correction to that particular situation, if possible. Um, we would we would agree. These are intended to be proactive recommendations, and I'll defer to Don or Jerry to answer that, but just... Uh, I really there's, I agree with what you said. There is, that is what our intent is to do. And we will certainly, uh, with the additional uh, staff, once they are on board and trained, um, that will certainly help us to further along the development and the oversee the implementation of the corrective action plans by the properties. Thank you. Mr. Fitzgerald. I, I, I must say that uh, you know, the FDA finding that uh, NISDOT has not provided sufficient resources to the SSO program, obviously they want to make a statement like that, it's not negotiable, but it is so open-ended that uh, we don't know really if it's two additional staff people make all the difference in the world, or ten additional staff people make all the difference in the world. So I guess I would agree with uh, with Jerry Shook that he will make things better, but I didn't hear him say it's going to solve all the problems. We'll just do the best we can, and That's correct. the proof will be in the pudding. Well, and part of this, I fully agree, and when I met with the FTA auditors as part of their exit, with both of my hats on, 
um, it was clear that we were looking for comparative and best practices from other states. The PTSB is actually the model <laughs> that is used. This kind of arrangement is the model that's used and they've taken a lot from us. We have looked at staffing and we have some recommendations that um, we'd like to talk to you about, about how we lessen some of the load on some lower incident um, accidents that the Transit Authority has a huge workforce doing and we can then focus more on the proactive sides as well as hiring these people. So Mr. Fitzgerald, it's a, it's a very good point and we think this is part of the solution from what staff has relayed to me, but we're also looking to get staff working through the executive director more focused on those areas where we get the bigger impact and one of those areas that will be discussed in the future and potentially acted on for you as a board, although it is technically DOT, but we'd like your support, is to consider taking some of those very small accidents that are in the bottom threshold and New York City Transit Authority has a very significant and well-honed machine on how to go out and do accident investigations and move more towards an audit kind of approach of the smaller ones and concentrate on us being more proactive in both the administrative tracking and um, upfront system safety work, not just when it's time for a plan to come forward. So we've, we've had the beginning of those discussions and we'd like to bring our recommendations in addition to the staff forward to this board for additional conversations and future meetings. See, we haven't had an opportunity to look at the safety plans in full depth, so how it aligns with what the what the board's recommendations are for a safety plan, we're not quite sure with that, you know, the comparison. If they're meeting those standards, if they're approaching those standards, if they're following through on them. So I, I think more of a, like you say, a way of auditing and, and finding out if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing is, is also important. Well, I know that probably Dennis and I have both been in the position of having the Public Transportation Safety Board work with us on our system safety plans. And years ago, at the beginning of this process, it was a much more proactive working through, making sure that things were being done in advance of the actual adoption of the system safety plan. And it was a great help to, I'll speak for a smaller system at the time, it was a great help to us to have that separate set of eyes. So that's the kind of thing that um, Mr. Baker has been talking about, trying to shift back both on the rail and the bus side to, to more focus on that. And maybe, Don, I can just lean to you for a few comments. Sure. The, um, I, I, you're absolutely correct, Dave, um, Mr. Burke. Um, the, um, our interest in, at this point is to be much more proactive uh, than reactive, which um, uh, over the last several years, um, uh, it, uh, the board staff uh, has tended to, to end it up because of just the way the board was operating at the time. Um, and we were reacting to, uh, to accidents and such. We would rather prevent, uh, be in a position of recommending actions that would help prevent accidents. Um, and so what we're doing is looking, is, is kind of looking at what, what we can do in terms of being able to review system safety plans and such. And, and, and understand them better, make sure that they're properly complied with so that, uh, you know, ultimately we're preventing accidents instead of having to react to them. So. I will restate on behalf of the Commissioner and as Chair of this Board that this, this audit is something we are taking very seriously and are taking a hard look at the relationship and the staffing complement and patterns that need to go to not only resolve these issues, but put the entire safety effort that's headed under the PTSB um, to improve that overall. So, um, do I have other, do I have a motion and a second and then we can continue discussion should there be additional questions. A motion and a second to adopt PTSB Resolution 1898. So moved. Second. Second, Mr. Burke. Um, any additional question? All in favor? Aye.
The issue is that okay. the IG can only vote on matters relating to the MTA territory. So what I've suggested to Mr. Kluger is that he vote to adopt, adopt the resolution as it relates for purposes of his vote only to those issues which relate to the MTA. You do have a quorum for both MTA and non-MTA, so I think that's an appropriate uh, Yeah, as to the matters contained in this audit and the action plan, as to matters concerning the MTA, I vote in favor. All right. All right. That um, Trish will make sure that's appropriately reflected in the minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Excuse, and, excuse me. Um, uh, I, does, should we have a separate resolution for that, or is, okay. can it be? Is it is it something that needs to be mentioned within the res body? I, of the resolution? I think it's okay as long as the record reflects that he is only uh, voting to those issues okay. and contained in the report that refer to the resolution with the one typographical error in our response that I pointed out to Mr. Baker. So yeah. there was a minor glitch in the report two different dates will the staff will correct that before the official response goes out but I, I don't think you need a separate resolution thank you and there um, are no system safety plans by the way for rail That's right. all right um, moving on to the bus side um, Mr. Fabian and his staff have been busy over the last few months. I'll turn over to the, the bus cases um, as the first set of actions. Mr. Fabian? Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, we have four no report cases that we are offering to the board for review today. Uh, those four cases, of course, are where the staff did not find uh, contributing factors to the cause of the accident based on the actions of the property. So we have no recommendations those cases. Uh, those are four no report cases. Uh, 9614, 27, or 9727, 9843, and 9878. If there are any questions from the board members on those cases, I'd be happy to try to answer them. All right. If there are none, we'll just move on to the abbreviated report. Okay. Uh, we have eight abbreviated reports for today. Abbreviated reports are actions where we did find some contributing factor on behalf of the bus company involved in the accident, but those uh, recommendations from the staff were adhered to, and we are making no recommendations to bring forward. Uh, I would like to particularly point out a particular case uh, within this group, and that is case 9565. Uh, it's important to note, and for the board's uh, information, which they may not already have, there's been a lot of activity going on throughout the MTA. Uh, in the past several months, and in this particular case, the information uh, is important that the board know that the MTA has been doing a lot of restructuring and that the MTA New York City Transit uh, Office of uh, Safety and Training has been involved in a lot more than just MTA. They are also doing a lot of the training for the MTA bus company and now for MTA Long Island bus. Uh, so they are handling those three distinct, previously distinct groups are now being uh, trained and evaluated uh, under the uh, the bus system safety and training um, group of the MTA, New York City Transit. They are also um, having their accidents analyzed by the Office of System Safety through New York City Transit. So that, that group that Ms. Ray spoke about earlier that investigates the accidents uh, for New York City Transit, MTA, New York City Transit, are also getting involved in doing the accident investigations at Long Island Bus and MTA Bus Company. Uh, given that information, uh, I'll take any questions on any of the abbreviated reports. The, those, the training is taking place. It was done by the individual uh, units before. Now it's all consolidated. It's being that's, consolidated. That's what you're it, it's a long process because they are the uh, three very large uh, authorities. It does take a lot of time, but they are now going through that process where the uh, New York City uh, MTA, New York City Transit training programs, policies, procedures, et cetera, regarding the training of new employees driving buses and uh, and the accident investigation ends of it will be done, and it, it's a process that's ongoing, uh, that it will be done at both other MTA authorities, which is Long Island Bus and MTA Bus Company. And this is all with the, and this is all with the intent that by bringing it under that umbrella that is well trained and been functioning well, that that will have a very positive influence on 
the incidents in those other operations? Yes, it will. We're very comfortable with that situation occurring. I guess with no other questions, any, I'll, I'll any, turn it back to you, Ms. Ray, for a vote and acceptance. Any other questions for Mr. Fabian on the, the um, bus case reports? Um, we will take an action to adopt the bus accident case reports before we get into the system safety plan. Um, may I have a motion to approve or to accept the bus accident cases? Mr. Burke, a second. Um, any last minute questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Um, Mr. Fabian, if you'd move into the system safety program plan up resolution updates. Thank you. We have seven safety plan resolutions that are recertifications, meaning that these programs have been around for a while and they are just submitting their updates for recertification and their biennial requirement. <coughs> We're asking for the board to support the acceptance of uh, these seven properties. Um, I'll take a motion and a second and for discussion. Oh, it has to come from this side of the table since they okay, are I'll make a motion to accept. Thank you. Second. Second. All right. Um, any conversation? Comments, questions? Um, the safety plans, have they followed the model similar to the rail, well, the rail safety plans that have been forwarded to us that the DOT has developed as a yes. sample? We have a set of three different guidelines that we offer all the properties that we have online for them, and we meet with them when every new property comes on board. Uh, those three separate guidelines are for large, medium, and small. Uh, companies because there's radical differences between the small and the large obviously and so we have uh, uh, basically all the same elements in each one of them but more detail as you get into a larger system but each one of them is is uh, following the set of guidelines that we provide to them that have been uh, institutionally adopted uh, across the nation in the past 10-15 uh, years. And with the emphasis now on corrective action plans they also have been inclusive into these plans? No, there's a difference between the rail side and the bus side, and that the rail side is required a lot by FTA uh, regulation, whereas most of the bus side is, is basically what they call voluntary standards. In other words, there's not currently regulation that requires each system to have a safety plan or to have a security plan that you have on the rail side. So there is uh, still a marked difference between uh, bus and rail systems throughout the country, and including New York State. New York State does require by regulation uh, that each system has a system safety plan on bu both bus and rail. Uh, the bus side, we do not go into uh, things such as security and such that, that the rail side does. Well, I'm more concerned about correcting a particular uh, event or accident that has occurred by coming up with some sort of correction mm -hmm. to prevent that in the future. The, under the powers of the board, we always have and have supported that through the staff and any investigation that we have done, that a corrective action plan uh, would be instituted, either an accident can cause that where we may go in and audit a property or during a system safety plan review which may lead to an audit situation if we find a lot of discrepancies and an issue that uh, the company is having a difficult time complying uh, then we would issue them a critical action plan where they would uh, be required to respond to us and that is all under the um, uh, support and regulatory authority of the board not not on, the, not on the national side, but just the PTSB side but has that authority, and we, we have used that many, many times. That's for the individual event, or is it for historical purpose, or, or for future purpose as well? It's definitely for future purposes. Generally what happens is uh, we'll investigate an accident, and it'll lead us to looking deeper and farther, and looking at the overall system. And generally when we come in with a uh, corrective action plan or a critical, critical action plan, um, it's for the overall system and it's for the future and it, it's the recommendations that are far reaching to the overall operation. So then why wouldn't this be inclusive in a, a safety plan of, of the property? It is inclusive of the safety plan, it's just not required by, by uh, federal. federal regulation. The only difference is that on the rail side there are clearly required federal responsibilities that the state and the Public Transportation Safety Board are required under federal law the state PTSB law and regulations support that requirement, but those are driven primarily by the federal government with some additional work that we actually do that's a little different but is consistent with the federal guideline. Currently there is not such um, guidelines and requirements on the bus side. 
Um, however, we are hearing that more and more, based in large part on New York's program, that there is a question about whether there should be federal requirements that are similar to the rail requirements on the federal side for states to act in an oversight role. Um, I believe we'll keep you updated as that conversation goes forward, but as far as being proactive, our bus safe, system safety program was intended to do exactly what you said from both my previous understanding and my current understanding of how the staff operates, which is to identify, become proactive, set recommendations up that not only resolve the immediate problem, but also <coughs> reduce um, the potential of that problem reoccurring in the future. Is that correct, John? Yes, thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second, um, and Mr. Kluger, since none of these are MTA properties, will abstain um, so a vote to approve the system safety plan resolutions. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposition? That's passed. Um, we now go on to staff reports, starting with Mr. Baker. Uh, as uh, Chairperson Ray um, mentioned earlier, despite the strict hiring freeze and an partial response to the FTA audit, uh, we have received permission to fill two PTSB rail support positions in the metropolitan New York uh, area. Uh, these positions were posted on, on January 12th, and uh, we hope to have them filled within 30 to 45 days. Uh, and we want to thank um, Chairperson Ray for the extraordinary effort that she put forward to, to helping us get the, this through this very difficult budget time. So, um, Council noted after the last meeting that um, with the reorganization in the department, um, there wasn't, uh, no one was clearly or officially designated as the executive director. Um, recently, an official order was. Uh, was drafted and signed, uh, which uh, provides that uh, Dr. Gary McVoy will be the executive director, and um, uh, and in today's meeting, I've been designated to serve in that role. Mr. Ryback has been going through to make sure that we're meeting all the responsibilities, and for instance, Mr. Kluger when. He is unable to attend, can do a designee. Unfortunately, the other board members do not have that authority. But just to make sure that we have um, all of those appropriate um, orders and letters of designation on file, and those are being updated just as a course of action. And the record should reflect that Mr. Kluger did provide us with a, a permanent designation that if he cannot attend, he has designated someone to stand in his place. So that will clear up the record. And, I believe Mr. Baker has a copy of that, which would be incorporated into the PTSB's record, so he doesn't have to do one every time. He may not be able to make it, and that's acceptable. Yeah, uh, I have designated from my staff uh, my director of uh, intake and intelligence, Ms. Aramica Brown, who has attended a few meetings in the past, and uh, I will have only one official designee, although I will attempt, uh, as I've continued to do so, uh, most, if not all, of the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for Mr. Baker? All right, then we'll move on to the um, rail update from Gary Shook. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, since the last board meeting in November, uh, we have had six new criteria accidents and 32 non-criteria accidents investigated by the staff. We had seven open cases, uh, which included the two that were presented to the board today. So we're now sitting at five. Um, as far as the rest of the staff, we pretty much spent the last uh, time period compiling the response to the FTA audit that addressed our corrective action plan that will eventually bring closure to the 17 findings of noncompliance that were issued at, at, during the audit. And we hope that uh, or we note that the closure of the many of the findings required some comprehensive revisions to existing policies and procedures and standards that not only uh, the state safety oversight or PTSB had, but also that the rail transit agencies have. So 
We've been working uh, pretty much day in and day out with both the NFTA and the N NYCT towards getting those policies and procedures revised. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Shook? All right. Uh, Mr. Fabian, in addition to your report, the long-awaited, um, going to be top of the bestseller list, I'm sure, um, fire analysis and report update. Um, John, you can just fill us in, and then if it's all right with the board, we're going to take a few minutes to do a short presentation on the um, bus fire analysis that was completed by um, our staff. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, current caseload uh, in the last uh, that we presented for this meeting of six new criteria accidents. A total of 31 are investi under investigation currently. Uh, we had 12 presented for today's meeting, the four no reports, the eight abbreviated reports. Our oldest case under investigation currently is uh, August 8th of 2007, uh, which involves a combined case. That's a relatively old case, but it involves a combined case, so it's being uh, added and combined with another case that is of a very similar nature, and that's why that uh, the case is as old as it is. Uh, we had seven safety plans for recertification for today's meeting. Appreciate the board's support on those. Our bait fish update as far as staff outreach, uh, we've released and distributed the 2009 calendar year dates and locations of the bait fish classes for this year. Included are two recertification classes and two certification classes. Uh, they're scheduled to be held in accessible locations throughout the state. Uh, this year, Binghamton, Rome, Kingston, and Syracuse. And we've also notified uh, 10 particular systems uh, out of the 115 that we have under our jurisdiction that have had their four-year certification expire and we are also providing uh, a general mailing to all systems and county sponsors as to the availability of this program. Site reviews uh, we continue to do as time allows. Uh, we've engaged a, a latest review with uh, First Transit at Norwich and we continue to follow along with the other reviews that we already have open which is um, approximately 10 at this time. On the bus fire study, uh, that report has been distributed in the package to the board for their review. Uh, I do have a short PowerPoint presentation and given our technology, I'm going to try to see if I can't turn this on so the board can have a better view. Of course I don't have a screen so that's part of the problem. And it didn't turn on. One thing at a time. There we go. It's flashing. The screen's in. Maybe <laughs> lighting here. Lights. Uh, we got to get the. That's not my presentation. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I would first like to start off uh, by thanking uh, a committee that we put together in order to provide a lot of information uh, that was garnered during this report and, and the report itself. Uh, and that committee that I want to thank personally, uh, Board Member Kluger, who was part of that uh, committee, and also uh, the MTA New York City Office of Safety and Training, Steve Idell, Charles Degas. Scotty Weinstein, and CDTA of Albany, uh, the, the Office of Safety, Tom McKay, who, uh, and myself, who, uh, who have all worked together to try to make this uh, report come together. Um, and I think I also need to thank uh, Steve Trudell and Matt Sokol, who are of our DOT staff, worked uh, a lot of hours to bring the, um, the information of the data into the available charts and tables that uh, make things uh, a lot more clear to understand. This is just a summation of the report itself, uh, but I just want to go through this. Um, that there are a lot of things important here that I wanted to point out to make sure that we, we do have a, a good point of view as to what we are looking at. Uh, the review included a five-year study. So these were from 2002 to 2006. So some of these are obviously uh, six, seven, eight years old, and we need to keep that in mind when we look at recommendations going forward. Now we're also looking at 120 fire investigations from a pool of 11,000 buses that operate statewide during that time period. So we're looking at, a, at approximately a third 
of 1% of the, fires, of the buses that are operating in New York State uh, experienced fires during that five-year period. That's a fairly low number. Um, there is a time later in my analysis also that I will address uh, a recommendation at the end uh, concerning the time frame of these accidents. We look at a peak that occurred back in 2004. Uh, we average about 20 fires a year. This went up to about 34, and that spiked the attention to the board to say, hey, maybe we have an issue. Let's take a look at some things. And that's what the, uh, the report did. So we looked at a number of different things that we originally uh, had approved uh, through the board process. And the first thing we can take a look at are, are where these fires were occurring. So if we look at bus fires by company, we see that uh, New York City Transit was experiencing the most number of fires. However, we also have to realize that they have by far the most number of buses out on the road. They're the largest transit authority in the United States, and uh, by far the, the numbers uh, obviously look like they reflect like an issue, but there's not when you take a look at uh, some of the, the next slide. Uh, this slide also shows us that there are other companies, but we only have 25 companies represented, and there are 115 companies uh, throughout New York State that's under our jurisdiction. We only had uh, 25 companies uh, have fires that were reported to the PTSB and investigated. Uh, so again, that's that's a low number. If we look at actual uh, number of buses and revenue service versus the number of, of fire actual uh, occurrences, we see that where we first saw New York City Transit was high on the list. We see that they fall right in the in the low of the group, uh, which shows us a distribution of of where fires occurring and and to what relationship per hundred thousand revenue miles. I also should point out it's not fair also to pick on Tioga County who has the highest because of being as small a system as they are. Uh, this ends up being a statistical anomaly where their number appears very high but they only had two fires in the entire process. So, um, you know, we need to look at all of these statistics in, in line of, of what they stand for and, and some of the background behind them. Generally just looking fires by origin. Uh, we don't really see a huge trend here when I mean, we have a, a lot of fires that are occurring in the engine where we would expect them. Uh, so we're not uh, overly excited to see that they, they are occurring in the engine, but also other areas such as air conditioning, the undercarriage, uh, some tire fires, uh, brakes that involve hot brakes, etc., um, and mostly the engine compartment. Some areas that we don't really worry about that we have uh, run the charts on, and you have those in the report, incidences by month, uh, day of week, we found more were occurring uh, Wednesday th or Monday through Wednesday, which is uh, illogical given the uh, heavy travel that it experiences, and a lot less during Saturday and Sunday, which is much less travel. We also looked at time of day, and we found that fires occurred during the heaviest time when the buses were under the heaviest amount of power and work uh, to be done carrying the heaviest loads during uh, those times uh, of rush hour traffic, and so those coincided. Um, we also did not find anything unusual about the locations throughout the state. And we are happy to report that the incidences of injury is extremely low, where we had only a couple of uh, reported injuries, and those were of smoke inhalation. When we look at the uh, causes of fires, uh, I think it's very interesting to note that the non-maintenance items that were tracked, and again, this is the 120 reports, and this is information that was gleaned from the accident reports that were previously done in that five-year period, uh, we found that a majority of them were non-maintenance items, and that means uh, an internal failure of a component that was not predictable by maintenance. It wasn't a maintainer's fault who could not see during a PMI that something was about ready to fail. And that would be the parts of the internal parts of a turbo. We have a lot of bearing failures of turbos. Uh, a starter in internal engine parts, uh, failure of high-pressure lines, etc that are not detectable de during a PMI. We also see though, when we do look at the entire focus, we do have fires where maintenance staff failed to discover and identify fire potentials. Uh, and that may be leaking lines, maybe chafing electrical lines, which is a, a very, very key component as we have found uh, for the causes of fires throughout uh, this history of uh, five years. Um, chafing cables, obviously they, they ground to short and create uh, a very strong fire potential. We took a look at fires by age of bus and we found a spike uh, at about six years of age. Um, 
we weren't sure exactly until we, we really looked at why uh, this may be occurring. Somebody may think, well, it should probably be at the end of the life of the bus. We do see 14 to 17 to 18 years, very low. That really is because there are very few buses around at that point. The average age bus life given to the FTA standards is 12 years, and so we see a lot of buses going out uh, later than that. A lot of people keep National buses longer age. than 12 years. You said average age is 12. You didn't. Oh, no. I mean, the average age of the, the life expectancy of a bus is 12 years, yeah. uh, not the average age. I didn't mean to say that. Okay. Um, so at 12 years, you see them retiring and being replaced by federal funds. You do see a lot of companies these days maintaining that beyond the 12 years, so we do have some in existence beyond then. Uh, but the six year cycle is what we were able to determine. Uh, are pretty much from the heavy, ur heavy urban systems uh, who put so many miles on a bus that it needs rehabbing, engine-wise, et cetera, at about six years, and that may be because of the uh, disturbed electrical, hydraulic lines, et cetera, et cetera, which may result in a spike of, of uh, fire incidences. And, and you said that also correlates with the road condition at the, at the body and the... Right, that these are, he these are heavy ur urban systems where this is showing up, not in your, not in your upstate systems. We also wanted to take a look at bus fires by make a bus and see where what manufacturer is experiencing the highest number of fires. And we found on this chart, you see Orion is on the bottom. Uh, looks like it's uh, proportionally way out of proportion. Uh, but if we look again uh, as to why that might be, we look behind the statistics. Uh, we see that in this particular situation, Orion makes up 38% of the statewide fleet. Uh, they were involved in approximately 50% of the fires. Uh, representing 38% of the fleet, so you see a, a strong correlation of their, the most popular bus and the most number of those buses are, are around the state. Uh, so logically they may be involved in a majority number of the fires. Uh, this chart also lets you know that uh, Nova at 28%, uh, New Flyer at 18 um, MCI at 12 and some other vehicles that make up about 4%. So looking at some of the trends that we did find, the most common area is the engine compartment. The most common related causes are electrical and high pressure lines. A 74%, that, that's really dramatic as far as where we need to keep looking at, where we need to make some changes if we can in order to assure that these don't uh, occur in the future. And the most common sources are the non-maintenance items, uh, the 51%, meaning that we need to perhaps begin looking outside of our jurisdictional properties. And that will come up in, in my recommendation at the end to begin involving uh, the outside systems, the suppliers, the manufacturers, uh, in order to get on board and see what we can do about uh, reducing future accident or future fires. Did I go backwards? No. no. Oh, okay. The finding trends most common age is six years. I just went through that. Uh, most commonly uh, involved manufacturer Orion and uh, also the largest uh, fleet. Which brings us to where. Uh, what we've done in the past over those years, in fact, over for the past 25 years, what the PTSB uh, board and staff have done in order to try to eliminate fires. We've issued several safety advisories, and, and those have generally been on those electrical short issues. We had some issues with some buses with water intrusion that were causing uh, shorts, a lot on the rerouting those cables again, and the high pressure lines. Uh, and one area that really doesn't come out in the statistics is dispatcher training where you may have a, a driver calling into a dispatcher and getting misinformation if he declares he can smell smoke and a, and a dispatcher may say, uh, well, try to get it to your next stop or try to get it to, you know, back into the garage or something. Uh, and so that was an area that we, we put out a safety advisory uh, helping out each of the systems. Uh, we also developed along the Baitfish programs, uh, one, two, and three are required classes throughout the systems. We developed Baitfish four as a preventive maintenance class in order to get out to those folks who needed a little bit extra help in the preventive maintenance areas, generally where they were experiencing fires or high out of service rates because of, uh, of poor maintenance. And that class specifically deals a lot with fires and dealing with uh, preventive maintenance for specifically fires. In 2003 we did a bus fire demonstration conference which is also part of the uh, part of the study. I've included some photos in there and it, it uh, very clearly shows that after one minute the interior of a fire, interior of a bus is not uh, survivable due to a fire because of not the flames themselves or the heat, but because of the toxic fumes that are uh, inside the bus that make it uh, unsurvivable. So in summary of the report that you have, there are 29 total recommendations. Uh, the key initiative that I'd like to point out to the board and, and look for um, 
support from the board, and, and that is number one to to create a task force, um, and that task force is one so that the uh, committee that we already have established can can continue can continue uh, to look at the uh, the current agenda, what's happening right now. We looked at what happened back in 2002. We really need to be looking at what's happening in 2008 and projecting what's going to happen in 09 and, and 10. Um, so we want to remain current, and by doing so, we would like to, with the board's permission, uh, work with a task force uh, that involves the board, the industry, and our partners uh, to resolve some of these future issues. We'd also like to mail this document uh, with the board's approval and review uh, to all the involved parties, all of our 115 properties, um, and to include the bus suppliers and manufacturers and our and our partners in the national uh, arena, which is uh, APTA. Um, so that's it in summation. Um, I know it was kind of fast, but uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, and the report does cover much more detail. Uh, so I guess at this time I'll turn it back to uh, Ms. Ray with, and any questions that may be from uh, from the board. Mr. Fitzgerald. Great report, John. Um, a couple of questions and a, and a recommendation. Um, recommendation, as the task force goes ahead, we've really got to get some manufacturers on board. Absolutely. Since uh, you know, the, the selection of cabling and piping and hosing uh, and how they're routed in the engine compartment uh, are very important. And the engine compartment in a bus is no different than our cars now. We're just trying to cram more and more components into a very small, very hot space. And manufacturers can do a lot to prevent problems down the line. So I would recommend that you get them involved. Um, as far as trends go, did you find any connection between PM cycles, scheduled cycles, and fire incidents? I mean, some, some systems are used a 2,000 mile Right or a two thousand hour cycle. It's only used a six thousand mile. We had some limitation in, in the one hundred and twenty reports uh, that went back as far as they did. Some of the information wasn't as readily available as we hoped it would be. Uh, looking at all the systems, but we did not find a relationship. We found some fires occurred um, because there was a recent maintenance done on the bus and something was disturbed, and a part wasn't put on right or. Uh, there may have been something rerouted because a, a, a maintainer might have moved something and moved a cable and now all of a sudden it starts chafing. Uh, and we also found some where it was within 100 miles of getting ready for a PMI. And, uh, you know, something chafed through and grounded to short and, and that happened. And again, I can't overemphasize the, the finding that most of the fires we found were non-maintenance items where wouldn't matter what day it was in for the PMI, it wasn't going to be found. It wasn't going to be a predictable event. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I think a lot of our maintenance folks around the state were being blamed for a lot, was, oh, you had a fire, well, it must be maintenance related. And, uh, and we didn't always find that. But um, there is still a lot that maintenance people can do in order to understand where they're happening. And, and, you know, part of it, I think, is getting this information out to them and understanding uh, the importance of clean buses and, and proper PMIs and, and the new technology of, uh, you know, not using metal peak clamps going to plastic and, and making sure that uh, they do all the recalls that, that come out uh, as far as um, different parts and making sure that when they replace a part, they replace it with a quality part and it's the same part, not not another, uh, you know, I don't have a, an electrical cable that's uh, 10 feet long, well, I'll use this one that's 15, and all of a sudden they've got an extra 5 feet to deal with. Those are some of the issues that we found maintenance-wise. Yeah, I, I understand that, um, but I... I a pinhole leak in a hydraulic line caused by vibration against the component. I mean, can a skilled maintainer inspector really find that or or not? I mean, I, I, Depends I, on where I, it is. I appreciate the difficulty you've got as far as trying to judge culpability. And, and the only other thing was a question: what's the um, what's the current status of suppression systems and and their application statewide? Uh, any of the hybrids have to have them. Uh, most of the systems have them. Some of the older buses don't have them. Uh, most of the systems are are going with uh, that type of uh, suppression system. Whether well, there's several different kinds out there, and we don't we don't make a recommendation to a particular kind, but we do suggest that uh, systems consider that for their for their uh, you know uh, procurement of any vehicles. Do you happen to know what the add-on uh, price is for that? Uh, I would hate to quote that at this time. Um, 
I'm not sure. It's not all that expensive given the fact that you have a $500,000 bus. Uh, it's usually a couple hundred thousand dollars, or yeah, a couple hundred thousand, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, it depends on the type you get, and it depends on, on, on to what degree you, uh, what, what type of nozzles, how many you want, where you want them, and things like that. Thanks, John. Thank you. Good report. Thank you. Mr. Burke? The, the PMIs, they're all based on a manufacturer's recommendation, or does the property say, well, you know, I think we should do it, you know, based on our experience? It's both. They, they can't exceed the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, so that's one of the process. So if the manufacturer says a 6,000 PM, 6, mile PMI, the company cannot exceed that. If they have, however, understood that they have very rough terrain and they're very, you know, um, heavy conditions where they require a more frequent PMI, then we would expect them to use a more frequent interval. So you may see them go to 3,000 or 4,000, even though the manufacturer is saying six is appropriate. And we have that with multiple types of buses across, you know, an MCI going across the road uh, from New York to California may only be PM to 12,000 miles, whereas your heavy urban buses down in New York may be PM to be 4,000 miles. Um, I too would like to thank John and all the folks that have worked to, to do this. This is not a consultant report from outside. This is the folks that deal with this in, day in and day out. So this is a, a commendable first step. Um, John, a couple questions and then one observation. Um, the most common bus age is six years, but um, as we know, we're coming up on another wave of much older buses. So. Um, have you begun to talk with your proposed task force or others, um, barring potential money from the stimulus, which might give us some additional infusion to get some newer equipment on the street? Um, we're going to see that aging out curve that happens about every 12 years in the state of New York. Um, is there talk about you know just reinforcing things that need to be looked at in an older bus to get to get it passed? Um, is that part of a discussion or something? That you could potentially consider is it not even a bit you know an issue uh, my plan is to have the task force consider all those areas and especially future issues because uh, if we're looking at you know this particular report looks at events that have already happened we're not going to do anything to go back and and prevent them there's a lot of things that are happening because of technology buses are running so much hotter technology and electronics especially is overwhelming to some extent to where you need to have a person extremely well trained in order to be able to do the PMIs now. Um, so you need a technician, you don't even need a maintainer, you need a technician to do it. And so these are the areas that we really need to get into and we really need to sit down with the manufacturers and what I would like to do is see that we have component parts. When we do have a failure, that component part is identified. We follow up on uh, identifying the type of part, where it was manufactured, where it came from, and track and look for, you know, uh, Perhaps it's not an OEM part. Perhaps it's not going to perform as it, as it should be, and it, maybe it's not passing the standards that they need to. And take a look at those things in order to try to prevent and, and have more longevity as we run into uh, more issues. One of the biggest issues we have right now is clean air. In trying to get to those clean air and try to meet those standards, we have extremely hot exhaust. We have areas that are particular trapped filters that get over 1,000 degrees, and on some buses they're, they're starting the tops of the buses on fire and the the marker lights, the wiring, and et cetera, because it is so hot. Now the manufacturer, you know, delivers them with with uh, heat blankets, et cetera, and and in different ways in order to provide protection. But as soon as that's disturbed by maintainers, if they don't get it back exactly right, it becomes too hot. That heat escapes. So those are all the areas that I think the committee really needs to look at and have an input on the procurement side and the standard side for the future and try to make a point there. Yes, at uh, one of the committee meetings and also with representatives of, uh, of, uh, of the MTA and, and the bus company, John gave a very detailed presentation as to that issue of the buses running so hot, and I think that's where the recommendation that it's critically important to involve the manufacturers and the study and, and the reasons for the task force to go on. So it, it's almost the opposite. It's not, it's not the older buses, it, it's potentially it really the newer buses and that's what right. may be on the assembly line as we speak that could lead to fires four, five, six years down the road based on John's uh, representations to us. Uh, which were excellent, and as a member of that committee, 
Uh, the work that, that John and his staff did was, uh, I believe, exemplary in the production of this and looking at this from all angles. And I certainly uh, believe that this task force must continue. And uh, whatever support that, that we can give it, I, I will certainly do. That's great. From the point of information, can, can we make a motion that, the, that this task force be established and, and continued? And, or is there some sort of fiscal restraint involved? No. I think these are all volunteers and using existing resources is my understanding. Um, and I think we should at least start with it on a voluntary level and see if there's anything that would dictate going further. But, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, you were going to continue to basically take some of the folks you pulled together for this stuff. I have, I have discussed individually with those people, and they are very much looking forward to continuing that process. Okay. Then, that, then I would make a motion that we have John continue uh, working in, in, you know, with that task force. A second? Sure. Second. Okay. <coughs> Any other discussion? We have a motion on the floor. Um, I think this is an excellent way to bring these issues together and also differentiate between what is reality and factual versus what is perception, which is sometimes our biggest challenge. Um, with the whole concept of a, a bus fire, a vehicle fire. Um, so um, a vote to support that. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. All right, John, you have now the official marching orders. Very good. Thank um, you. The one other um, place that I have suggested that John's internal group work with um, the DOT Transit Bureau, because one of the places you did see John try to break out what the... Um, ratio was per 100,000 miles. It's really important to understand the size of the system, if they're increasing the mileage. You know, are these, these are not apples to apples comparisons. These are numbers that are pure and accurate based on the numbers, but it doesn't give you a sense if we've all of a sudden increased our fleet size, increased service on the street. So we're going to try to better marry up in the future the statistics we get through our public transportation board and we have to report to the federal government and just be able to overlay this so you can put them again it'll just add another layer of perspective so I um, just wanted to add that point all right there's no other questions under new business we um, have just to verify our 2009 meeting schedule. Council? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Council's report. How can I forget him? <laughs> I'm sorry. But. That's okay because there are no legal matters of significant <laughs> to the board. Although, I, as Don indicated, we are trying to tighten up some of the rules and kind of make sure we follow them. So I, I may not like a rule, but if we ever roll on, we really need to follow it, which is why we had Mr. Kluger have to give us that letter and take care of the official order on the executive director. So. But other than I have nothing else to add. I apologize. That's okay. No apology necessary. All right. Um, under old and unfinished business, anything that we have, Mr. Burke? Under old business, uh, I'd like to ask a question of Jerry. Uh, regarding the stenciling at some of the uh, Long Island Railroad stations, has that all been completed where it was intended to be stenciled? So the, the, uh, the platform gaps. Yes. The... Um, quarterly report from the uh, MTA, which uh, they supply us on their update on their uh, activities. Uh, it's just handed to me 15 minutes ago, so I haven't had a chance to review it yet. But it's my uh, understanding that uh, that particular item was completed. Uh, I, like I said, again, I'll, I'll review this and uh, Certainly pass that information along as soon as we have a chance to look at it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other old business? All right, then we'll move on to new business. Um, Chris just passed out just to reaffirm that everyone had it the meeting schedule and locations for the um, 2009, still get used to saying that, 2009. Um, and our next meeting is scheduled for March 12th in Albany um, from 11 to 1. Any comments, questions? Um, really important that it's a relatively small group of folks of experts that help us with PTSD. Um, just looking to confirm that these dates and schedules work for um, most of you, or at least most of them work for all of you. <laughs> 
Um, Jerry, did you have a question? If, if I may just... Yes. If I may just go back a minute to Mr. Burke's question. Oh, okay. Uh, as I turn the page, the first page, uh, the Watch the Gap stenciling on the platforms uh, has been completed at all 20, 124 stations on the Long Island Railroad, and all the Metro North stations are complete. Connecticut uh, is still working on some of theirs up in, on Metro North's territory. Uh, and of interest is is they uh, actually started, a, Long Island has started an additional program where they're doing the platform edges in red to show a more heightened uh, awareness to that uh, red being better than yellow, giving a perception of more danger, and it's being uh, well received by people. So that's the best update I can give you right up right up to the moment at this point. And any uh, plans for future modifications of the platforms or changing the dimensions? and. There is an ongoing uh, engineering program to uh, not only uh, modify platform edges, uh, platforms themselves, in addition to, in addition to the edges, uh, and it's all incorporated uh, in their report that they give us uh, what they're ex actually working on at this point. I, I don't know at this time of the year. It's probably more of a uh, spring or summertime project, but I'll certainly. Uh, pass that along as soon as we get a chance to review it. I, I think I think I recall we had discussions on this previously as to what their particular task force activities were and, and that be you know, Jerry's getting information on that but the board is not, so that's why I'm I'm in the dark on this and I just wonder if that information could be passed along to the board as well. Jerry, in your next report, both as appropriate sharing with board members and equally important in your next um, report, rail report, if you could include an update on where we are for the entire board, that Certainly. would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now we'll move on to the meeting schedule. <laughs> um, the meeting schedule is in front of you. Um, this is after a lot of input and trying to balance multiple schedules. Um, we've moved to 11 o'clock versus 10 o'clock for train schedules to be able to easier, more easily accommodate the movement between Albany and New York. Um, and our next meeting is March 12th up in Albany. So this doesn't need an action. I think we've already approved the calendar for next year. Um, with that being said, I would like to um, speak on behalf of, as the chair and on behalf of the commissioner, thanking the staff for working very hard. In addition to their normal workload, they've taken on additional responsibilities to meet our responsibilities on the rail side and to go ahead and do the bus investigation and fire, fire report. Um, and that's been an extraordinary effort on both sides. So appreciation for the efforts and our pledge to continue to work to get the additional support that's necessary to be even more effective. Any other comments? And if not, I'm open for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We'll adjourn. Thank you all very much, and again, Happy New Year. Um, of course, we, yes, sir, we, yes. Um, um, if you could give us an example, sir, I'll, tr I'll try to. We'll try to get a read. Is it? Could you give us an example, sir? Yeah, of yeah. hybrid buses that are silent are very dangerous for pedestrians that are vision impaired. They're not sound, just like motor vehicles, hybrid motor vehicles. And so, we in the black community are advocating for requirement for the sound aspect, portable aspect on hybrids and electric vehicles. Is that what you're saying? Um, we can, well, I, I would be glad to take that question back and bring it um, just as a, anything that relates to safety. And if this isn't the right place, then I will be glad to make sure that we get you in touch with the right folks to do that. If you would, though, please um, give the gentleman beside you your name and phone number so that we can respond back to you. That would be very helpful. And your name, sir, just for the record. Ken Stewart. Okay. Thank you, sir.
The meeting stands adjourned.